Part 2, in which Tom, by a series of misadventures, brings down the wrath of his father in such wise that the author, for fear of forfeiting Tom's chances of becoming a hero in the reader's eyes, discreetly veils what actually happened when justice was administered. The mournful wail that swept at dismal intervals through Mr. Playfair's house touched the sympathetic chord of compassion in the heartstrings of gentle Aunt Jane. Stealing softly up to Tom's room, she entered on tiptoe. Master Tom, his hair disheveled and the channels of grief plainly traced upon his cheeks, was lying prone upon his bed. The sight of her compassionate face opened a new flood of tears. "'Don't cry, Tommy,' she said softly. "'I wish I was dead!' cried the young gentleman. "'Now, now, Tommy!' exclaimed the horrified and too credulous aunt. "'Don't talk that way. It is sinful, and I'm sure you don't mean it.' "'How bad I do!' he howled, and I wish I, I, wish I was b b buried, too, under the ground. I'll tell you what, Aunt Jane, I'll run away. Oh, Tommy, how can you say such wicked things? Come now, can't I bring you up some breakfast? Don't want any breakfast. I'll run away and sell newspapers and have a jolly time. Dear, dear, where do you get all these notions? queried Miss Meadow, whose confiding spirit received these exaggerated expressions of grief as so much gospel truth. "'Tommy, what do you say to some buttered toast and a bit of cake?' In spite of himself, Tom could not help showing, at this stage, some interest in sublunary affairs. "'No,' he said, sitting up in bed. "'But I'd like to have some pancakes.' "'They're all gone, Tommy, and it's so much trouble to make them.' "'Well, then I don't want any breakfast,' he said, throwing himself back onto the bed and relapsing into sobs. This last exhibition of tactics won the victory. Miss Meadow descended to the kitchen and put herself to the elaborate work of making pancakes for the world-worn youth of ten. Upon her departure, Tom smiled in a manner not entirely devoid of guile, and the smile, running counter to his tears, formed a sort of facial rainbow." Presently, Aunt Jane appeared with the pancakes and other delicacies, and very shortly indeed, Tom fell to, in a manner most encouraging to behold. "'I say, Aunt Jane,' he said, speaking with as much distinctness as the crowded state of his mouth would allow, "'you're a real, genuine, old fairy grandmother you are.' He intended this for a magnificent compliment, but Aunt Jane did not look particularly gratified. To a miss of thirty, the epithets old and grandmother were rather suggestive. Perceiving that he had made some mistake, Tom added, I'll tell you what, Auntie, I won't bother your pantry or scare the cook for, well, for a week. He spoke as if he felt how handsome his offer was. That sounds better, said Miss Meadow. So you'll be a good boy now, won't you? Honor bright, Aunt Jane. And Miss Meadow, with his consolatory assurance gladdening her heart, departed to attend to her domestic affairs, having first given him his liberty. Availing himself of this, he was presently engaged in the back yard in constructing a chicken coop. Hello, said a voice directly behind him. Hello yourself. Is that you, Jeff? He made an answer as a boy of about his own age with a dollish face and clad in soft garments met his view. "'Got any chickens yet?' asked Jeff, ignoring Tom's question as being superfluous. "'Not yet, but I guess I'll trade off my baseball with Tom White for one.' And Master Tom picked up a pine board, which he proceeded to split into smaller sections. In the midst of this interesting operation, a chip flew up, striking Jeff rather sharply upon the lobe of his left ear. "'Confound you!' shouted Jeff, rubbing the injured member with pathetic earnestness. "'You needn't curse,' said Tom resentfully. "'That ain't cursin,' retorted Jeff in a sharper key. "'Well, it's vulgar all the same,' insisted Tom, unwilling to give in entirely. "'It isn't. It is. I tell you it isn't. I tell you it is. I guess my pa uses it. 
My pa doesn't, and he ought to know. Their voices took a higher range. See here, Jeff Thompson. Do you mean to say that your pa knows more than mine? Yes, I do. Tom seemed to think that the conversation had reached a point where argument should be advanced by other means than mere verbal expression, for he suddenly struck out straight from the shoulder, and before his astonished opponent could hold up his hands to ward off the blow, a sturdy little fist came into forceful contact with Jeff's nose. As Star's gladiatorial flashed before Jeff's eyes, his yell of anguish broke upon the silence. "'I'm killed!' he shrieked as the blood gushed from his injured member. The fast-flowing stream frightened Tom exceedingly. "'Oh, Jeff!' he cried, clasping his hands. "'I didn't mean to hurt you so much. Cross my heart, I didn't!' And he rubbed his thumb so as to form an invisible cross upon the right side of his sailor jacket, supposing, in his ignorance, that he had precisely located his heart. "'Go away! Don't talk to me!' said Jeff, suspending a howl to deliver this important communication. I'll never speak to you again. Oh, Jeff, don't stand bleeding, implored Tom. Come along to the pump, and I'll help you wash yourself. I won't go to the pump, roared Jeff. I'll just stand here and bleed to death, and you'll be hung for a murder. This threat, coupled with the sight of the flowing blood, filled Tom's soul with horror. "'Good gracious! Jeff, I believe you will die if you keep on bleeding.' "'Do you think so?' inquired Jeff, paling a little, for he was not so very anxious for death. "'Yes, Jeff, I'm afraid you're gone, and you'll be cold and stiff, and the big policeman will come and grab me, and a judge will hang me in a black cap. Oh, gracious!' At this dismal prospect, Tom blubbered. "'I guess I'll go to the pump.' said Jeff, and two mournful little lads sought together the cooling waters. Despite the wholesome application of the water, the bleeding still continued. Their looks of dismay deepened. Suddenly Tom's face lighted up. Oh, Jeff, I've got it. I heard Aunt Jane read in the almanacs that if you hold your arm up when your nose is blooded, it will stop. Forthwith, Jeff's right arm reached madly towards the sky. To the intense gratification of both parties, the bleeding soon began to subside. "'I say, Jeff, hold up both arms. That ought to make it stop twice as fast.' With equal docility, Jeff struck the new attitude. The bleeding was now almost imperceptible. "'And, Jeff, what's the matter with your leg?' "'How? Suppose you hold that up, too.' There was a returning twinkle in Tom's eyes, which Jeff failed to notice. How will I do it? Lean up against the pump, and I'll fix the rest. Jeff obeyed, and Tom, catching hold of the patient's right leg, lifted it up, 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 till Jeff shrieked with pain. Drop it, you goose! You needn't get excited. I didn't mean to hurt you, said Tom apologetically, as he lowered Jeff's leg a few inches. It was a funny sight. Jeff, leaning against the pump, with his two arms raised perpendicularly, and his legs supported at a right angle to the rest of his body by his sympathetic friend. The bleeding soon ceased, and Tom showed his sense of humor of the situation by giving the leg such a twist that Jeff shrieked louder than ever. "'You're a mean fellow, and I won't speak to you again!' vociferated Jeff when he had recovered speech. "'You oughtn't sass a boy in his own yard,' said Tom argumentatively. "'Who's going to stay in your old yard?' and Jeff, in high dudgeon, made his way into the alley. Tom now devoted himself for the next five minutes to the construction of the chicken coop. Presently weary of this lonely occupation, he clambered over the fence into the great alley in search of some companion. To his great disappointment, not a single boy was to be seen except Jeff Thompson, who was poring interestedly over a kite. The loneliness which had come upon Tom caused his heart to soften. I say, Jeff, got a string for that? You needn't mind about this kite, answered Jeff without raising his eyes. Because if you haven't, went on Tom in a gentle tone, I'll lend you mine. Jeff's countenance softened somewhat. 
Tom, seeing his advantage, followed it up. Oh, Jeff, you ought to see my new flint. Where'd you get it? This, with awakened interest, bunkered it off Sadie Roberts. Come on up and I'll show it to you. This ended all hostilities, and within five minutes, Jeff and Tom had entered into a solemn contract to be partners, thenceforward and forever. An hour or so after this binding contract, Aunt Jane was calling up at Tom's room to ascertain what was keeping the young gentleman so quiet. His tranquility was easily explained. Neither Tom nor Jeff was there. Miss Meadow made careful examination of the room, paying special attention to Mr. Meadow's room and the pantry, but finding not even a trace of her graceless charge in these places, she hurried into the yard. Her eyes swept anxiously over the limited view. The yard was deserted. Tom! she cried. Yes, um. Good gracious! Where in the world are you? Up here! Miss Meadow raised her eyes, then gave a shriek of horror. On the slanting roof of the house, Tom was busily attending to a dovecot with one hand, while the other was held by Jeff, who was standing on the top rung of a ladder, his little nose tip tilted like a petal of a flower, just appearing over the opening in the skylight. Tommy! Get down out of that this very instant! Good gracious! Do you want to slip off and kill yourself? I want to put in some feed for my doves. I don't care about falling and killing myself, came the tranquil answer. Tommy, I want you to get down from that dangerous position instantly. Oh, Auntie, just one minute. I'm all right. Miss Meadow was ready to cry with anxiety. Tommy, if you don't obey me, this very... Miss Meadow paused on seeing a look of animation that suddenly appeared upon Tom's features. Did you hear it, Jeff? What? It's the fire bell! Hurrah! And with a quick spring through the trap door, Master Tom disappeared. Now he thinks he's going off to the fire, soliloquized Miss Meadow, but out of this house he shall not stir one step and she hastened in, constraining her mind to the proper degree of firmness. But alas, as she passed through the kitchen and dining room into the hall, four sturdy little legs twinkled down the front door steps, and two treble voices, raised to their highest yelling key, completely drowned her command to come back. Miss Meadow sank into a chair and wiped her eyes. It was mortifying to confess even to herself but she had to admit that Tom was fast slipping beyond her control. The mild, timid little lady was no match for the wild, impetuous, thoughtless boy. If Tom could have understood the pain and anxiety his conduct had wrought in her gentle bosom, he would have thought twice before taking so abrupt a departure. But her tears, so far as he was concerned, were as dew upon the naked rock, and, shouting with excitement, he hurried away through the streets to the scene of the fire. The dinner hour came, but no Tom, and the poor lady, with aching eyes, peered long through the parlor window, hoping to catch some glimpse of the returning adventurer. As the quarters passed on, Miss Meadow became more grieved. "'I must give up,' she said to herself. "'The boy loves me, I am sure, but I cannot take the place of his poor dead mother.' He does just what he likes. Unless something decided be done, he will grow up to be self-willed and undisciplined. Thank God tomorrow is a class day. But even at school he is not under the proper charge. Miss Harvey teaches well, but in Tom's hands she is powerless. At length, wearied with waiting and vexed with the disagreeable train of thought, Tom's recent escapades had occasioned, she endeavored, with poor success, however, to eat a little dinner. As she was about to leave the table, a light but slow tread was heard without. The tread drew nearer, the door opened, and Tom, his stockings bespattered with mud, his shirt collar crushed out of all shapeliness, his hat gone, and an expression of shame upon his dirt-smeared features entered the room. "'Well, sir,' began his aunt, who, in spite of the joy she felt at his reappearance, was determined to be severe, "'how are you going to account for yourself?' Tom hung his head, fell into a close consideration of his feet, and having no hat to twirl, began pulling his fingers. 
Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Tom appeared to consider this difficult question. Do you hear? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Yes, sir. This in a subdued tone and after due reflection. Now, sir, you needn't think to escape a flogging. Let's hear your story, and then I'll attend to you in your room, where you may remain fasting till supper. Healthy boys, as a rule, are not pleased with the prospect of losing their dinner, nor is the number great of those boys who entertain no prejudice against flogging. Tom saw that matters had come to a crisis, that nothing but a masterly stroke would win the day. Quick as thought, the young general had planned out his campaign. Advancing to his aunt's side in all humility, he suddenly caught her hand and said, "'Auntie Jane, I'm sorry.' Before Miss Meadow could become aware of his intention, he threw his arms round her neck and kissed her. Under the warmth of this greeting, her icy sternness melted away and flowed off in a gentle stream of kindness. "'Poor boy! You must be tired, and hungry, too. Indeed, you don't deserve any dinner. But sit down. I haven't the heart to see you go to your room in hunger.' Tom was not slow to avail of this permission, and while Miss Meadow, her bosom agitated by a conflict between duty and affection, helped him to the various dishes, Tom plied knife and fork with no small earnestness. For the rest of the afternoon he distinguished himself by his conduct. In fact, he was trembling on account of the wrath to come. His unusual excursion would be reported to his father, and then it would require more than Tom's address to avoid serious consequences. Nor were his forebodings without foundation. When Mr. Playfair heard from Miss Meadow's lips the account of his son's doing, he compressed his lips tightly, knit his brow, and then, after some serious reflection, called for the culprit. "'Sir,' said his father sternly, "'You have gone to the limit of your tether.' Tom did not know what going to the limit of one's tether meant, but entertaining the idea that it was something very horrid indeed, he set up a dismal wail. "'Sir, you need to learn obedience and respect to your elders. Next September, just five months from now, you start for St. Mars Boarding School.' And remember this, if you give any trouble there, I'll not allow you to make your first communion for another year. Now, sir. But as Tom Playfair is to be the hero of this veracious story, I cannot bring myself to put on record what his father said further. Still less have I the heart to chronicle what Mr. Playfair did. Tom was very noisy on the occasion. Up to this hour he had known the force of his father's hand only from the friendly clasp. But over that occasion, which Tom never forgot, and over the ensuing five months, you and I, dear reader, drop a veil which shall not be withdrawn.'